In this video, we're looking at personality. What makes our personality? How much of it is genetic and universal? Things that we find in all different types of people across the world. Whether they're American or they're from Papua New Guinea or Australia or Norway. What is universal in our personality? Probably passed down through evolution um, and traits that help us survive. And then on the other side of it, what is maybe shaped by our environment? How are certain personalities valued over others? Or how does modeling, as Albert Bandura put it, and the way people act towards each other shape the way we act and we think in our personality? So kind of the, the beginning we're, we'll, we'll get into is Freud. But before we even do Freud, let's look at a couple of the more clear-cut personality terms that you've, you've probably already heard. So psychologists define personality as the unique attitudes, behaviors, and emotions that characterize a person. So this is really interesting. What makes us uh, unique? What makes us have our own personality? And how much of that is cultural? Well, most psychologists and most scientists would probably argue that actually your personality is much more on the genetic side and not much of it is uh, that personal. That being an individual doesn't really exist. That's a very Western, more specifically, it's a very American idea. And the humanists, um, like Abraham Maslow, are the ones that believe that maybe personality can be something that's formed through free will and choice. However, most social scientists and psychologists are going to argue that actually humans are meant to be very collectivist. And in most countries, like in Europe and Asia and Africa and even Latin America, most of the rest of the world, we see collectivism and the community are, and the people and family are more important than maybe the individual personality. So your personality is, is to go along with the group and, to, and that it is innate, that it is passed on through our traits. So two types of personalities that uh, have been identified by psychologists that in theory is that type A, and you've maybe heard this term, people say, oh, that guy is so type A. Type A are people that tend to feel a sense of time pressure. They're very like <sighs> kind of stressed out. They can get really angry, like what is going on? Or like they get flustered very quickly. They can also be very competitive. Uh, they can be ambitious, which could be a good or a negative thing. Um, Cause they're kind of, they can be get goers and kind of paying attention to details. And, and they, they, they have their check marks and their checklists they get things done and they work hard, they play hard, and some people like that, um, and that can be very beneficial. However, uh, we do know that there's pretty strong research that people are type A tend to have much higher risks of heart disease and than the general population and stroke, because all this anger and, sh and sh can turn into stress and frustration and self-criticism, and it can actually have negative health consequences where kind of the opposite is a type B person. Type B individuals <clears throat> are very relaxed, they're easygoing, but they, uh, they don't completely fall on the opposite end of the continuum. Some people fit into neither one. Uh, type A can be chilled and less stressed out, and maybe more the, the person you think that's kind of meditating or really watching the situation before they jump in. But again, not everybody's type A or type B. You could be kind of in the middle of the spectrum or you could even say you're much more intense than a type A, could, you could picture, or a type B. But you'll hear these terms that people say, oh, they're so type B, like you're too type B, like you don't get anything done. You just are so relaxed. Now, the Barnum effect is a very interesting concept that psychologists have looked at, examined, and defined in psychology. So I'm not sure if you're clear or you've heard the story of P.T. Barden. So there's a movie called The Greatest Showman. Um, and it's a really good musical about the guy that started Barnum and Bailey's Circus. P.T. Barnum's kind of the, the first creator. And what P.T. Barnum essentially does, and the big idea you could see in the musical and in the movie, and if you read any stories about P.T. Barnum, is he was really good at spotting people that were very unique. Uh, and he kind of pushed what was going on at the time as people did what were called freak shows. So they would find a bearded woman or a woman that needs to shave because she has lots of testosterone or, or 
you know, and she had facial hair. Or they'd f he'd find a super tall guy that was maybe seven feet, you know, like, and or he would find a super heavy set person or all these unique people. But what he did that was very different than just what they called at the time, like these freak shows where people would pay money maybe to see these weird looking people and, <clears throat> you know, or like a two headed, you know, uh, kid or something is he he had them working together and he made an entire show out of it, which we now call circus. A circus is when you have a bunch of, at the time, like these freaks or people that were very weird or stood out and people didn't understand that these are just people that might have had different unique abilities and hormones and innate traits about them. And he put them together and he made a lot of money. So he was the big showman at the time. Now, one of his famous sayings is there is a sucker born every minute. So the question's kind of is like, okay, P.T. Barnum, you're using people and making money off of them. And he's like, I'll take their money. Uh, you know, they want to come look at something unique and different. I'll give it to them, whatever show they want. Uh, as long as they're paying customers, we're good to go. Now, the Barnum effect, though, in psychology is that what P.T. Barnum applies is this idea that you give people what they want. Um, and you can make money and you can manipulate them to some degree. But the Barnum effect of psychology is that psychologists know that most people describe their personalities in very vague general terms, okay? So a lot of uh, soothsayers, like people that say they can see the future or they can tell you what's happening with you, or you know, fortune tellers, you can see the crystal ball in the bottom corner, or astrologists or people that can read the stars, not a, um, and astrology is not a science at all. Uh, and getting into like kind of these ideas of metaphysics, like explaining things that are, you know, the unexplainable. Well, basically the bar effect is people use those ideas to make money off people. And if you have a very generalized personality view, which most people do, it's pretty easy to make money off of you. So I gave the example in class. We talked about how like, you know, what's your sign? Well, my sign is Taurus. Well, one of the big traits of a Taurus is they're stubborn like a bull. Well, anybody that knows me, Mr. Metro, you're going to say Mr. Metro could be so stubborn. Well, being stubborn is a pretty general idea. I'm sure that I could convince somebody if I, if I work on it enough, even if they're, quote, unquote, not the most stubborn person, that they're stubborn about, about certain things, right? Like, well, you're stubborn about your beliefs, though, or your belief in God or your religion, or you're really firm in this and that. And you're obviously a Taurus because you're stubborn like a bull or... You know, and the next one is Gemini. Geminis are easy to, because Geminis are quote unquote supposed to be two faced. Oh my gosh. Well, I've seen this, and, and I can, you could pretty much say this to anybody. You've got your good days and you got your bad days, and you let us know, and blah, 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 blah. So it's very easy to use astrology and crystal balls. And if somebody's already hurt or they need mental health supports, it's really, really simple at kind of manipulating and using in them. And that's the Barnum effect, that just kind of making money off of or playing with people and just kind of reading their general behavior and generalized ideas about their behavior and their traits, and giving them what they want and let them pay the ticket to see the, the, the uh, circus or what used to be called a freak show, which is horrible. Now, the next theory is the psychosexual stages of personality. Freud... Uh, really, again, is the first clinical psychologist as we know it. He really gets into personality, very much analyzing. That's why he's the father of psychoanalysis and really much analyzes the mind. Now, his theory, uh, which I think in a lot of ways has been kind of pushed to the side now and disregarded as not very accurate. However, it is interesting, and we have to learn it because um, it, it can be tested, and it's a part of Introduction to Psychology. Uh, Freud believed that our personality is essentially set in our, from our childhood, that our childhood really makes our personality. Well, if it's genetic, that makes sense. And we, we found out that the most genetic trait about our personality is our temperament. And I think you could see that. People say, oh, I'm turning into my father or my mother. Well, that's true. Uh, chances are, you and I have a lot of our personality traits in psychology are passed down from our parents. 
and our grandparents and our blood and our ancestry. So that is true. Um, now, do things happen in our environment, in our childhood, in our teenage years that shape our personality? Yeah, especially our ch childhood and teenage years. And we know because of memory, we tend to memorize and remember our teenage or adolescent years the most vividly. So I'm sure you guys have seen stuff like your dad or your mom still wear those Air Jordans from the 90s or their dreams to get a pair of this or that. And they reminisce about the, uh, the you know, being a teenager. And then you ask about the 20s, and they're like, I don't remember the 20s as much. I think I got married kind of stuff, <laughs> even though it was much sooner and less far away than high school. So please pay attention to your high school years. Enjoy the moments, guys. High school is so rememberable in your mind. Um, but he says that what happens is all most of this is sexual and it's happening in your childhood and that what happens to us sexually in our thoughts and our behaviors as a child is, is really defines who we are later in life. And where he's probably very wrong is <clears throat> you have to remember that Freud was talking to people that had been extremely abnormal in terms of psychology. They were not the norm. He didn't talk to everyone. And remember back 100, 150 years ago, the only people that would go to a psychologist or stay, stay at a sanitarium uh, or a place where people are sick mentally would be people that are very mentally ill. So a lot of his patients really did, um, had been physically and sexually abused. Um, and they had, <clears throat> they have had her terrible experiences with people that really did cause mental stress and maybe post-traumatic stress disorders and they did need therapy for that. And I've worked in that environment. Uh, when I worked in the adolescent psychiatric ward with children and adolescents up until 18, and you could see there was a lot of issues that children had that were really, really bothersome to my, this day for me to even think about what they went through on any human level because the empathy, it really hurts you. However, Freud had his own shadows and he had his own problems when he was a child he had had some abuse so he probably projected and that's actually a term that Freud teaches us in this some of these ideas so the first thing he says that we have what it's called the oral stage of zero to one where children enjoy suckling and biting because it gives them a form of sexual pleasure now I could see how he maybe derived at this but he's probably wrong because if anything, we know that biting and suckling are probably instinctual because kids are going through sensory development. So they're developing their senses and eating, tasting, smelling, hearing, feeling, touching, biting are all a part of sensory development. Just kind of like if you've ever had a dog. Uh, and I have a dog, Max, and he was a puppy and he's barely out of the puppy stage and he will put anything and everything in his mouth. That's how he senses or feels things. And sometimes he'll put his, my hand in his mouth or he'll kind of nip at me on per, and it's not on purpose and he's not a bad dog, but that's how he feels things or he gets your attention. Now, I don't think it's psychosexual. Um, and also it's essentially, it's really important for a baby to, to suck. That's instinctual clearly. And you guys will probably learn when you have children, one of the first things the baby needs to learn to do is to latch on and suckle the, the, the mother's milk out of her breast. And sometimes the nurses have to help you out. Like with my son, we had, it took us a second, not much, but sometimes the baby comes out and the newborn ma, baby and mom don't necessarily know how to do this. So for, you know, thousands of years, uh, obviously the elder women and uh, men probably helped them do it and taught them how to do it. Otherwise the baby will die. So yes, it is instinctual. Now, during the second stage, he calls this your anal stage of one to three, children are sexually gratified, which means they get pleasure from the act of elimination, which is a fancy way, a nice way of saying pooping. So it feels good to poop. Well, that may be true, again, but it's probably not sexual. What probably happens with elimination is it feels good because your body wants to naturally do it, and it wants to do it correctly. So now, for example, we have toilets that help us do things like squat and sit to go to the bathroom. So you sit on like a, I had a friend that had one, you put it on the toilet lid and it holds you up and you're in a squatting position. And I want to get very, very technical, but that makes absolute sense. Because we know through research now that in nature, 
we do need to sit and squat to go to the bathroom healthy because it clear it opens up your intestines and you sit in a way and position yourself so that you can poop without hurting yourself and toilets which were invented by the romans a couple thousand years ago uh they're still pretty much the same thing i've seen a toilet uh in ephesus turkey and in rome from thousands of years ago they were just flat stone with a hole in them and Back then, they, the king would even have a guy or girl sit on the toilet to keep it warm. So if he woke up at night, he could sit down on a nice warm toilet. How would you like to be the toilet sitting guy, right? But um, it's not actually good for going to the bathroom. Like sitting on the toilet, especially for long periods of time, is not good for you. So we have to think our ancestors would squat in the woods kind of more like a dog. Uh, and now we realize that that's actually how we want to design toilets. But the actual act of elimination feeling good makes sense because your body needs to do it. And if we don't do it, it could cause us to get sick or even die. Like it could cause us to bloat or feel bad or uncomfortable and starve to death back uh, when we could just go to the store to get food. So here's some of the stages again. He's got oral, anal, the phallic stage, latency stage, and the genital stage. And phallic means um, resembling a penis. And, uh, you know, latency is you're essentially dr dreaming about uh, sex and how this comes into it. And then the genital stage is kind of discovering your gen genitalia.